Hi, this is Jen Rubin, and this is Jen Rubin's Green Room. Lots of news today. For starters, Kristen Cinema, who is now an independent from the great state of Arizona, has decided she will not run for re-election to the Senate. Good news for Democrats. That means Ruben Gallejo, who is an excellent candidate, will have a clear field and will be going up against Carrie Lake, who is a crackpot, if you recall, from 2022, and certainly a MAGA loon. So what other news do we have? The Supreme Court this week, as we expected, decided that they would not knock Donald Trump off the ballot. But the way in which they did it and the internal politics of the court were fascinating. All they had to do was make a technical decision that the states cannot use Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to knock a candidate off the ballot. That makes sense, after all, because you don't want one state deciding one way and another state deciding another. But they went even further. They said, you have to have Congress act before you can knock someone off the ballot. That wasn't necessary, and it got the dander up of three of the more progressive justices who pointed out this was totally unnecessary, and they seemed to be coddling, as they put it, insurrectionists, meaning Donald Trump. Why should Congress have to act? Doesn't have to act for other portions of the 14th Amendment. This seemed to be their way of completely satisfying, diffusing the anger of the MAGA crazies who would storm the Supreme Court if they actually applied the letter of the 14th Amendment. So it was pretty blatant. It was good that the three justices called them out for it. And what's even more interesting is Justice Amy Coney Barrett no liberal she, kind of weighed in to say, I don't think the majority should have gone that far, but gosh, let's not shriek about it, meaning her more progressive colleagues. It was a weird thing to do and really gratuitous. She could have either joined in the concurrence or kept her mouth shut. And But I think it's a good thing, actually. I think she's showing, showing some independence, some level of discomfort with what the majority, in this case, really five justices were up to. And perhaps that's a bit of a positive sign for the really where it's all going to be, all the action is going to be focused. And that is on, of course, the immunity case, which the justices have decided to hear and will be hearing on April 22nd. So we'll keep our eyes peeled. Meanwhile, I want to point out that it is all not grim in the federal courts. There was an 11th Circuit ruling today concerning a anti-woke law that DeSantis, you remember him from his doomed presidential campaign, got through the Florida legislature which essentially says private companies couldn't meet, have mandatory meetings to discuss inclusion and equality and equity. Well, even the 11th Circuit, which is one of the most right-wing circuits we have, said this is the original sin, they use that phrase, the original sin of the First Amendment, which is discriminating basing basic on the content of the speech. It was quite the rebuke, not only to DeSantis, but to the whole movement of trying to weed out, suppress, ban books, ban speech, um, essentially eliminate any discussion that um, we have been and remain to be, to a large extent, a racist society. So score one for the First Amendment and maybe even score one for the federal courts, which are not completely uh, in Donald Trump's thrall. I do want to point out what was probably the most telling and the worst article I have seen from the New York Times in a long time. That's saying a lot. And I'm not referring to their poll, um, which once again shows within the margin of error, Trump leading. And if you look in the tabs, makes no sense whatsoever because it would assume that Biden is trailing among women. I don't think so. Um, Would also assume that the electorate is going to be Republican in leaning, which hasn't happened in decades. But put that to the side. I want to call attention to another piece they wrote, which was entitled something like Biden super fans who think the rest of us are crazy. I'm paraphrasing. 
apparently they don't know anyone who really likes Joe Biden. So they went out into the countryside like Margaret Mead tramping around in the jungle to find these strange eggs, these people who think Biden is doing a good job. Does that tell you something about their bias, about their lack of perspective? There are millions and millions of people who think Joe Biden is a very good president. And a lot of them, by the way, are women of color, men of color too. Don't they know any of these people? Are all of them cynical, urbanites, white like themselves? It was an astounding, revealing article, not of the people they were interviewing, but of their own perspective, that I can't imagine a world in which people are informed, look at what Biden has accomplished and think, you know, that's a good thing. He's been an excellent president. That's their mindset. Well, we are not going to get fair shake from the mainstream media, I will tell you. But I will also say that we get, I think, and even I do, get too caught up in the ridiculous polls and the ridiculous framing. This election is not going to be determined by the polls. It's not going to be determined by the New York Times. It's going to be determined by Biden getting out there, repeating over and over and over again the simple message, he's been a good president, the other guy is crazy and is leading us down the garden path to tyranny. That's it. That's the message. Good president versus crazy dangerous guy. And oh, by the way, with Trump spending a lot of time in courtrooms this summer and fall, most likely, Biden needs to make this point crystal clear. Trump is running so he doesn't have to be held accountable for crimes. That's what this is all about. He said it. he's going to get into office and either pardon himself or instruct the Justice Department to drop the federal cases He'll insist that the state cases be held in advance, and he will escape responsibility for committing crimes because he can get himself elected. That's the end of American democracy. If people can do that, then we don't have an equal system of justice. We don't have a president who is responsible for upholding the law. We have complete lawlessness, and we have really lost our way. And Biden shouldn't be shy about making that point. I know he doesn't want to talk about the substance of those cases. He doesn't want to give Trump grounds for appeal later on. But there's nothing wrong with saying this campaign that he is running is an effort to escape the long arm of the law. And that's something we can't allow. So a lot to keep in mind. We'll have more news, I am sure, as the week goes on. Remember, there's the State of the Union. And uh, if you check my Thursday column at the Washington Post, I'll have some good suggestions for Joe Biden. If you're like me, sleep is special. Without it, you're grumpy, you're ineffective, your whole day is shot. So I have a great product that's going to help you sleep better. You're like you. I used to struggle to find the right temperature at night, but recently I found a way to sleep in perfect comfort all night long. My secret is using NASA-inspired Silphil-infused bed sheets by Miracle Maid. Their self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding prevents 99.7% of bacteria and requires three times less laundry because they stay fresher three times longer. Thanks to Miracle Made, you can stop sleeping on bacteria that can clog your pores and lead to breakouts and acne. Plus, with no more gross odors, life is a lot easier on your household. You can truly sleep clean with Miracle. They're comfortable too. Their temperature regulating silver infused fabrics were inspired by NASA to give you maximum comfort. Imagine getting better sleep every night. Miracle sheets feel soft and luxurious without the high price tag of other luxury brands. They feel as nice or even nicer than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. So you'll feel like you're on vacation every time you get into bed. Miracle Made offers a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding, such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters. I know you'll love them. Go to Try miracle.com slash green room to try miracle made sheets today. And whether you're buying from them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, you can order today 
you will get 40% off. And if you use our promo green room at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash greenroom and use the code greenroom to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash greenroom to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Maid, for sponsoring this episode, and you can look for the link in the show notes. When we consider the state of American democracy and the threat from really a fascist right-wing movement, it's important to get context, and that is the one thing the mainstream media never gets. It's important to have historians, political scientists, people who have studied violent movements, and there's no better person to talk to us about that subject than Kathleen Ballou. She is a professor at Northwestern. She is author of a seminal book, Bring the War Home, the White Power Movement and Paramilitary America. We welcome her to the program. Hello, Kathleen. Thank you for having me. It's absolutely a pleasure. Now, in your book, Bring the War Home, you have an interesting and perhaps unique take on the origins of the violent right-wing militia groups. Tell us what that is and maybe how that differs from some other theories and analysis we've heard from other historians. Sure. So one thing that's interesting about looking at the long run of American history is that we can see that vigilante groups like the Klan, like militia groups, tend to have ebbs and flows in activity. And they're very clear waves. So you can plot them on a historical timeline. There's big peaks and valleys. Um, sometimes they're understood as discrete and sometimes they're understood as connected. But because we have that pattern, historians have spent a lot of time thinking about what correlating or causal factors might be at work in, in motivating those ebbs and flows. So people have proposed poverty, people have proposed immigration, civil rights gains, populist uh, movements. It turns out that none of those are as consistent a correlation as the aftermath of warfare. So we can look, for instance, at the Klan and every membership surge accords with big aftermath moments of the Civil War, World War I, World War II in Korea, and then the Vietnam War. Um, and uh, that, I think, owes in some part to opportunistic recruitment um, rather than sort of a one-to-one -one relationship of warfare and post-war activism. But it is a very consistent factor. Um, and I think that it means that now, in the aftermath of the global war on terror, we, we can look around and see that we are again in the middle of a surge. Well, that is a scary proposition. But let's go to the issue of warfare. It would explain, for example, this sense of alienation when people return from a war. It might also explain why many of these movements tend to exhibit signs of toxic masculinity. What other things about wars make them breeding grounds, if you will, for these right-wing movements? So one reason for this is also just tactical expertise and the skill sets that, that augment the violence of these groups. So we see over and over intense recruitment campaigns by the Klan and other white power groups um, to recruit and use um, active duty troops and also recent veterans for things like bomb making expertise, tactical readiness, access to armories, um, expertise in training paramilitary uh, armies, things like this. But it's also important to note that so if we if we look at, for instance, the Vietnam War, um, which is the period that I study and bring the war home. Um, it's not just veterans who are caught up in that violence cycle. It's also not just men who are caught up in that violence cycle. Um, I think 
perhaps part of what's happening is the outsized influence that veterans and active duty troops uh, wield within these groups because they have that command expertise. But the other thing is that um, as sociologists like Joanna Burke have documented, it turns out that all of us are more violent after warfare. And that cuts across who did and didn't serve, age group, gender. Um, everybody is more violent after warfare. And one thing that the history shows about Klan and white power groups over and over again is that they are opportunistic. They are ready and eager to exploit any social context for their own purposes. So I think part of it is that sort of expertise and readiness and the, the tactics that escalate violent capacity which they get from veterans. And I think it's also that they are opportunistically using this kind of broader moment of opportunity created by the aftermath of warfare in society more broadly. So the war in Vietnam ended in the mid 70s. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, we certainly had an uptick of these groups and we had the Oklahoma bombing. Do these groups directly relate to the Vietnam War? Do they reference it? Are they people who actually fought in the war or who were deeply affected by it? So yes and no. Um, what happens in the late 1970s is that a lot of groups and activists, and I'm using that word just for people who want to take action to achieve a particular result. I don't mean it in a positive way in this moment. Um, but groups and activists on the far right who had previously been at odds with each other came together around this shared story of the Vietnam War. Some of them had fought there and were deeply impacted. Some of them had not. But that story had tremendous cultural currency. Um, and it worked to bind activists together. Um, it worked to sort of paper over some of the bigger uh, differences between these groups. Um, and what happened is instead of the Klan and neo-Nazis and skinheads and militias, what we end up with is a broad white power movement where activists are moving very freely between all of those ideologies. People are sharing money and weapons and symbols and communications um, and really working together in an open war on the federal government from 1983 um, forward. Certainly, that's the same movement that propagated the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, it's also the same movement that was responsible for events like the Greensboro shooting in 1979, where four, excuse me, five leftist demonstrators were killed. Um, the assassination of Denver radio host Alan Berg in 1984, um, and a number of kind of smaller events along the way. Um, and I should say also Ruby Ridge is a white power event as well. So this is a full sort of arcing history up to the Oklahoma City bombing. It's also the same movement that is active in our present uh, moment. We'll definitely get to the present. Let's um, first um, look at what it was that the Vietnam War did. It's hard to think back that before that, we had groups actively looking to overthrow the government they may have been alienated or the Klan was there to frankly uphold the Jim Crow structure that the government was imposing. But this became something different. They turned against the government. Why did that happen? And was that somehow related to the experience of, if not defeat, at least not winning the Vietnam War? Absolutely. So one of the interesting things that happens here is that the story we tell about the Vietnam War, which is discreet from the, the war itself, really congeals and takes on a, a kind of stronger cultural and political life around 1980. So although the war ends before that, how we talk about what it meant and what happened is still sort of contested until around 1980. In 1980, we get a very strong social alignment around an agreed story that we tell about the war, not just in the white power movement, but in society more broadly. Um, and it's a story that should be familiar to listeners because it's the same one that you'll see in memoirs and films um, and sort of in short form and other cultural spaces. It's the one about individual veterans who are wronged by their service, lack of support by the government, 
And then, of course, this story also is backed up by many politicians at the time, um, perhaps most famously Ronald Reagan, who, as president, says that soldiers in Vietnam were denied permission to win. And he talks about them having to fight with one hand behind their back. So the story is not just about a lost war. It's about how the government um, and politicians betrayed American soldiers and did not let them win the war. Um Now, not to get too far into the weeds, but historians um, of the war don't agree with that assessment by and large. Um, But more importantly than that, what it does is create a sort of logic where white power activists could recruit based on saying that the war was proof that the government was fundamentally flawed. And then the other thing that happens is under Reagan, um, these activists... Uh, are very excited about the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. They think that under a Reagan administration, they stand to benefit. And then they are very frustrated because the kinds of policy changes that he enacts are way too moderate for the white power movement. They want things like reestablishment of Jim Crow or return to slavery or establishment of a white minority rule system like in South Africa, things like this. Um, And it's clear to them that that's never going to happen. So they have a series of conversations where they decide, okay, politics is over. It's just time for revolution. That's significant that that happens under a, you know, right wing president. It's not under the Carter administration, even though these groups were active then. Um, So it's a it's a move towards revolutionary warfare. And that comes in 1983. It is fascinating in that the stab in the back mentality is exactly what Hitler used following World War I, to galvanize the German people, that the government had sold out the German people. Um, Is that a coincidence, or does that have a internal logic um, that is just irresistible to right-wing movements? Well, I mean, in some cases, that's a direct import. For neo-Nazis who followed that ideology, they're they're using that very deliberately alongside ideas about um, needing to populate the land and needing room to grow that also accord with German ideas about, about that that were put forward by Hitler as well. Um, and certainly they are reading and sharing Hitler's writings. They are talking about those um about Nazis as sort of like-minded activists. They are following the trials of former Nazis as they are covered in the 1980s. Um, All of that is like live uh, political ammunition for the movement, as it were. But it's also sort of a, um, you know, that, that idea of being denied permission to win in Vietnam is also just a overwhelming, um, I guess I would call it like a cultural truth at that moment in the 1980s. Like it is it is far from only the white power activists who are interested in that idea or find it compelling. This is when we have, you know, the a series of uh, memorial parades and welcome home parades that are held like way later than actual homecoming. We get the, the discourse about people having been spat on and not welcomed home. Um, historians are also now excavating whether that is a story or a thing that actually happened in large numbers. Um, all of these things about how we how we tell the story and what it means for our country are very much up for debate in that moment. Um, and so the settling down on that denied permission to win story, um, that's, it's not just the white power movement that does that. that. That happens through our collective storytelling about the war. And that's the era of Rambo. That was yeah. such a prevalent view that here's this guy who, if you had just let him strap on all these weapons and go for it, America would prevail. So it really yeah. does go deep into the cultural, um, you know, uh, soul. It is interesting that these groups also change or seek to change the role of women. And that women in these groups and in the militia groups, in the cult movements that follow, um, are consigned to a particular role. Um, Talk to us a little bit about that and what the conception of women is among these sorts of groups. You know, this was the biggest surprise to me in the archive of this movement because most of what we know about these groups has been um, 
delivered kind of through an analysis of paramilitary masculinity. And that's right. I mean, their their first mode of engaging is to put on military uniforms and military grade weapons and march down the street um, or to secretly train in paramilitary camps. Um, and women are not usually welcome at those activities, although there are some exceptions. But it turns out that you actually can't see this movement as a movement unless you take seriously women's activism, because it is through all of the social relationships brokered by women, like marriages, um, child rearing relationships, uh, homeschool curricula, recipe campaigns, fundraising, um, even things like you know, who's going to cook the big spaghetti dinner at the racist Congress that summer. You need women for all of these kind of social things that end up cementing the movement together. So what I found was not only women wielding enormous symbolic importance as sort of the future of the white race via their reproductive capacity, but also women who were doing everything from driving getaway cars to writing their own circulars to starting their own women's auxiliary groups. There's a lot of them and they're very vocal within the movement. And I think, um, you know, missing conservative women is a problem that has plagued historians anyway, as the brilliant Michelle Nickerson pointed out um, in her first book. Um, we historians and also journalists sometimes have often looked at our people political, our people leaders, are they activists, using a definition of those things that comes from our collective sort of center left perspective of what is activism, what is what is leadership, what is politics. But what I found in this movement is the same thing you find in a lot of right wing movements where people will say, I'm not political, but dot, dot, dot. And then there they go writing a newspaper that comes out every month full of political ideas. Or I'm nothing but a wife and mother, and also I'm driving this getaway car. So I think um, one of the things that, that seeing this movement requires of us is to take seriously people's own ideological frame for what they're doing, um, and also to like read their actions as well as their rhetoric. Um, because in the actions of the women, we can see so much activity. And it's it's also the connection between the paramilitary phase of the movement in the 80s and what happens with the militias in the early 90s. Now, you mentioned their reproductive role. This is not, again, unlike the Nazi era, where they needed to populate, they thought, the white race. So childbirth fertility, the obligation to raise and nurture children, that becomes part of this movement as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I think that that is always intrinsic to the project of white supremacy. Um, you have to continue to have white babies if you are going to continue a white race, which you have decided is your nation and your kind of mode of or unit of governance, I guess. Um, and so policing white women's reproductive power and policing their sexuality becomes absolutely central in every white supremacist regime. And you can look at um, you can look at this comparatively with Nazi Germany, the Jim Crow South, apartheid South Africa, all of them have intense um, legal and punishment mechanisms regulating interracial sexual contact and especially the birth of interracial children for white women, not for white men. Um, and that is quite, quite significant. Let's fast forward to the present or the present-ish and talk about where you see the tentacles of this movement. You can look at what's going on in the United States in sort of concentric circles. You can yes. talk about everyone in the Republican Party. You can talk about people who wear MAGA hats. You can talk about people who run for office and pledge obedience to Donald Trump. And then you can get down to the people who went on January 6th and tried to overthrow the government with violence. Where in those circles do you see the influence of these 
right-wing militia groups? Is it confined to that center core of hardcore activists, or does it radiate out beyond that? It certainly radiates. So um, I think we need even a little bit of a finer-grained parsing in the middle. Um, So if we think, for instance, about January 6th, we're really dealing with three discrete sort of strands of people. One is MAGA, which you know, even within the group that went to protest on January 6th, there's a a big range of how intensive and how radical those folks are. Some were there to simply voice their concerns in public space. That's everybody's right. Um, Some were there to break things and cause trouble. That is extremist and sometimes violent speech, right? So there's a continuum even within that group. Then there's QAnon, which is conspiracy theorists. Um, In some ways, that's working the same as every conspiracy theory throughout the 20th century, like Protocols of the Elders of Zion, Zog, Great Replacement, Deep State, you know, pick your poison. It is all variations on a theme. In some ways, QAnon is a little bit different because of the speed and depth of radicalization. But um, as a historian, I still feel like we're a little too close to it for me to tell you more than that. (laughs) Um, And then finally, we have the smallest group, but the most organized group, which is the white power activists. These are the guys that are in groups ahead of time that had organized plans for what to do on January 6th, showed up in tactical gear, showed up with radios. They're the first to breach the buildings, and they're the ones who are now being convicted right and left for seditious conspiracy. Um, That is a material difference. Uh, between them and people who are sort of casual participants or even people who are radical participants who aren't uh, kind of in group like that. But what we have to think about is that any one of these events that we talk about when we talk about the problem of white power activism or white nationalism is connected to many other social problems in the present. The history shows us that this works with both public-facing action and underground action. So the public-facing action is, um, you know, January 6th, Proud Boys marching, um, Patriot Front marching and getting arrested, people showing up to pride parades and drag story hours, people trying to climb the ranks of the GOP in various local contexts. Um, and people sort of figuring out where they fit in, in, in mainstream politics if they want to take that route. That's all visible to us. There is also the underground, which is very difficult to see in real time. Um, for my money, we won't really know the full story for another 10 years, at least, unless somebody dramatically changes declassification law. Um And that we have to think about, like, the string of mass shootings carried out by white power gunmen, including Buffalo, the Tree of Life Synagogue, um, El Paso, um, Christchurch. You can go on and on like this. Um, It also includes, very likely, attacks on power stations. We know that there has been a string of attacks on power stations, and we know that white power activists are circulating manuals encouraging people to attack power stations. So... um, You know, that's a question mark, but it's a big question mark. Um, And then it also includes arrests of groups like Adam Waffen and the base who have been involved in, um, you know, intensely violent underground activity. So all of that together is kind of where the movement sits in the present. And it's an incredibly difficult thing in real time to try to connect all of those dots. Um, I've come to feel that learning about the earlier movement is a little bit like learning a language where once you have become aware of how this all works symbolically and ideology and how it fits together, um, a common response is to look around and go, oh my gosh, there's a lot of this because there is quite a lot of it right now. Um, And the pieces really do um, sort of fall into place once you are paying attention. Fascinating. Now, Even before January 6th, shortly after the election of Donald Trump, you had Charlottesville and you had the neo-Nazis, you had the theme of they will not replace us, you had violence. What were the origins of that? And both going forward and backward, where did they come from? And then how did they wind up, do you think, in January 6th and going forward? 
So I think that the major function of Charlottesville, the Unite the Right rally, was to sort of bring all of this back into our mainstream public political space. It had really gone underground for a while. Um, I would say between around 1996 and 2017, we know less about that period than before or after for a variety of archival reasons. Um, But it's also that there was a attempt to prosecute many of these groups after Oklahoma City, and there was a move towards secrecy by the groups, partly because of that pressure. Um, That did not, for what it's worth, decrease group activity. Activity, um, and in fact, militia activity increased after the Oklahoma City bombing. But it did change the way that these groups were organized and the way that they were working. Um, so part of that involved intensity of online activity. Part of that involved intense transnational efforts. Um, and then we have kind of the reemergence um, fueled by the alt-right and sort of early meme culture, um, and then coming into public real life violence at Charlottesville. Um, so a couple of important things about Charlottesville. First of all, it's another example of not just Klan or not just Nazi activism, but an organized and coherent bringing together of multiple groups. Um, And also it marks a sort of new chapter in the movement's attempts to find a open cultural window through which it can operate. So tiki torches and the slogans and the swastikas, but also polo shirts and khakis, right? They're making an attempt to look respectable and clean. Um, And then they found out through Charlottesville that the outright Nazi salutes and symbols are not working well for their public image. Um, And there's a pivot. So by January 6th, we're not mostly looking at swastikas and Confederate flags. We're mostly looking at like the Gadsden Purchase Don't Tread on Me flag. And we're looking at the, um, you know, kind of the more the more um, coded black and yellow Proud Boys stuff. Um, That's on purpose. And the Klan has done that throughout its long run. I show my students pictures of women's Klan outfits from the 20s for this reason, but they're, you know, they're fashion forward for the time. They're slender cut, (laughs) show a little ankle. They're like, they're trying to figure out what is the the window they can maneuver through. Um, Same thing with the Boogaloo Boys, which um, was briefly popular around the George, George Floyd protests. They're, they're sh- they showed up in those tropical print shirts in order to seem sort of, I don't know, carefree and non-threatening, even as they're talking about provoking race war. So, yeah, so the, the public facing part of this is always about PR strategy and how they can convey ideology while kind of getting the biggest public hearing they can get. They believe that if regular white people hear their message, they will, quote unquote, awaken and join the revolution. How does religion factor in all of this? Um, Is that simply a convenient recruitment zone for these people? Or is there something about the religious institutions and even the doctrine that serves to reinforce these right-wing movements? Sure. I would... um... I would welcome dissertation students who would like to look into this with more care, um, especially in the present moment, because so so there's sort of um, there's sort of three different threads powering these cultural shifts from the 1980s forward. One of them is this rising tide of white power activity. Another is paramilitarism, which is going through multiple sectors of American society, but like moving along the violent outcomes. Um, And the third is the rise of evangelical churches, which are getting bigger and more political um, and more sort of um, more right wing and sort of a totalizing way across that same time frame. Now, that's not at all to say that these are all the same thing. And I, uh, you know, it's it's not the same thing to write about the white power movement as to write about Christian nationalism. But certainly Christian nationalism and white power activists have some objectives in common. They have a lot of cultural terrain in common. Um, and there are people who are living at the fringe of, of the crossover space in that Venn diagram who would adhere to both of those ideologies. So, for instance, um, one motivating theology in the 1980s was Christian identity, which is still a live wire today. Um, that ideology says that white people are really the lost tribe of Israel, that everybody else is descended from Satan or from beasts, 
and that um, white people have to clear the world of the unfaithful before Christ can return. Um, So some people in the 80s who believe in that also are members of evangelical churches. So they'll describe themselves as like an identity Baptist, for instance. Um, But evangelical churches have a really different view of the end of the world than that because they have the rapture when people are going to be peacefully transported to heaven. Um, Some of this just comes down to, you know, fine-grained difference. And some of it is huge in what it allows people to think about the future, about possibilities, about what kinds of relationships they might have with others. Um, And all of that, I think, is still sort of shaking out. Donald Trump comes down the elevator in 2015. And either intuitively, like a feral animal, or through his advisors, he begins to amplify and encourage these movements, whether it's the moral equivalents at Charlottesville, whether it's the strong push to born, to uh, ban abortion, whether it's the hyper um, paranoia about an invasion on our southern border. Is this a coincidence? Is he kind of echoing back what he's hearing from the base? What's the relationship between him and these movements that really pre uh, previsage um, the rise of the MAGA movement that uh, predated Donald Trump? Sure. So I think there's two parts of that question. And one part is how he sees the white power movement. And the other is how they see him um, or how it sees him, I suppose I should say. Um, I was very reluctant for a very long time to even imply anything about what Trump might be attempting to achieve or do, or, or even farther than that, what he might believe. Um, because, you know, of the many journalists and historians who have now devoted their entire careers to trying to figure out what's going on, um, in his set of motivations, I like, (laughs) I, it's a full-time job and I'm not a Trump expert. Yes. Um, that said, I think we have now far past benefit of the doubt territory. For me, the turning point was when he started, Um, quoting Mein Kampf and not apologizing, started having dinner with people who are, you know, outright white nationalists and anti-Semite activists like Nick Fuentes in the Kanye West dinner. Um, And when he threw his uh, campaign rally in Waco, which is, I think it was sort of considered by many people to be a sort of just generally anti-federal government kind of a move. But within the white power movement, that definitely is a call to violence. Um, And there's no way at this point that he's not surrounded by people who would know that. So I think we have now, you know, at the beginning, I I wondered, is it just that he's interested in like mobilizing these people to vote for him? I don't think it's that. I think that there is a deep affinity between Trump's policies and the the political outcomes desired by white power activists. Um, I think it is at least that they are common travelers and I I think it might even go beyond that, but it's hard to know. Um, Now, what it means for the white power movement to have somebody like Trump, um, I think is probably a deeply divisive thing in the movement. My guess is that we would find people, because as we talked about, they turned revolutionary before when they thought politics was a closed door and they couldn't achieve anything. So if it's no longer a closed door, And if our mainstream politics now has space for quite a lot of what they would like to accomplish with policies like cruelty is the point of the southern border, um, one wonders, do you stay the course and keep trying for race war or do you pivot and try to seize mainstream political power? Um, My guess is that there will be people in the movement right now who are interested in either of those tracks. And that that means we have to be prepared for both kinds of danger to our society. On the one hand, we have to think about mass casualty attacks, attacks on impacted communities, um, attacks that are like show of force recruitment events like the January 6th march. 
um, and insurrection. And on the other hand, I think we have to worry about things like voter intimidation, security of election officials, um, authoritarian power grabs, and sort of the the security of our institutions against authoritarian rule. Um, so I think what it does is split open an even bigger kind of field of battle for this movement to take up. And you can see in some ways how making Trump a tyrant is a bizarre compromise between these two measures because you're attacking, destroying America, but on the other hand, you're empowering a guy who's on the ballot. Um, so the language of tyranny, the language of being a dictator for a day, you can see would be very successful with both camps. Yeah, and I think it's appealing to both camps in 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 different ways. I also think that um, were Trump to vanish from the political scene tomorrow, I don't think any of this goes back in the box. Like I think we are we are now in a period where these groups have been emboldened. They're now thinking about different kinds of action, um, and they've had some very successful recruitment actions, including January sixth, which have generated new memberships. Um, so I think it is something that we are going to be facing and figuring out how to deal with for the the near future, at least. We were alarmed to find out how many military, former military, law enforcement, former law enforcement people participated in January 6th. Is it relatively new that the military during a um, conflict, whether it's Iraq, whether it's uh, Afghanistan, whether it's the war on terror, that people in the current military become so radicalized and uh, identify with the movement? Or has that always been the case? So that's not new. Active duty troops have participated in these movements for quite a long time. I think what is different about the kind of post January 6th moment is that there has been at least some talk at DOD about facing that problem and dealing with it. However, that effort has been at various times stalled out, under under enforced, under I don't know if it's underfunded. It's it's hard to see behind the curtain of what's happening. But there was a, you know, there was a stand down after January sixth, meaning a total reassessment within the armed forces about the problem of extremism. Um, I think a lot of reasonable people agree that you can't take an oath to protect the Constitution from enemies foreign and domestic and at the same time be an enemy domestic trying to overthrow the Constitution. I think that's a fundamental tension in even belonging to any of these groups while serving. Um, but, you know, regulating that, the Pentagon has strugg struggled with that for decades because it fundamentally comes right up to the edge of rights that are guaranteed by that same Constitution about religion and association and free speech. Um, and I'm as sympathetic to that as anyone, but... I think, um, uh, you know, the the histories of the military show that it is incredibly good at providing service and education to its people when it decides to, whether that's wel welfare benefits or child care or education or mental health care, like the, the, the mental health care rates in the military are much better than regular society if you adjust for kind of the amount of exposure armed forces staff have. Um, the military is really quite good at this. So I really think if it wanted to, it's one of the biggest levers we could push to address some of this issue. Um, and but it's a it's an organization composed of a lot of different people with a lot of different beliefs. Right. And, and getting that to actually happen is a whole other animal. One of the things that frustrated me, and it certainly frustrated senators when he came up to the Hill, was that the FBI, which was tasked with collecting information on right wing terrorists, really did not do what they were supposed to. They have not collected the information. There seems to be a institutional aversion to doing this. Is that because the culture within the FBI is a little too close to, for comfort with the white ring, ring groups? Is it because they see other white men and say, well, they couldn't possibly be a danger? What do you think causes um, that aversion, not only in the military, but 
in the civilian law yeah, enforcement I mean, forces. So one thing we don't know is how big the problem of infiltration is in civilian policing broadly. And I'm not just talking about FBI, but um, I think even more in like local policing, there is no recording mechanism or tracking mechanism um, for this activity. And, you know, I live in Chicago and we had the shooting of Laquan McDonald's story, which showed that uh, police officers with a record can just move to another department and nobody even knows that there's a record of excessive force because there's no central record keeping. So there's also no central record keeping for um, extremist activity. Um, And even if there were, I don't even know how I would get those documents to assess how big this problem is. The FBI, I think, is more complicated because um, to me, I mean, so so a couple of things. Historically, this is the best the FBI has ever done on this issue. And I can say that like no holds barred because under COINTELPRO, it was infiltrating these groups, but not really effectively doing anything. At other moments, it has not even attempted to count or tabulate or keep watch on right wing groups. Um, for instance, after um, one a DHS report in 2009 that said that we should expect a surge in this activity because of returning veterans. Um, There was a blowback on Fox News, and they ended up pulling the report and gutting that department from, I think, 25 analysts to nine or something like that, maybe six. It, But just, you know, a precipitous gutting of the department. Um, And that's happened over and over again based on, you know, the political climate in D.C. and the executive and... um, Everybody reports to somebody. Even the finding in 2020 that right-wing extremism was now the primary domestic terrorism threat to the country, the primary terrorism threat to the country, um, that report got held up for, I think, six months before it was released because the Trump administration didn't want to release it, I, I suppose. Um, and, and of course, that did come out before January 6th, but, you know, we, we could we could use a little notice. That's all I'm saying. So the FBI, to me, is always, you know, a give and take sort of an operation. It's big. It's bureaucratic. And if you ever work in the FBI archives, you soon realize that <laughs> there are a lot of really good people trying their best to do their work. And then there are a lot of bureaucratic mechanisms that make it difficult to achieve that work. So I tend to have maybe a, a degree of sympathy there. But... It's also a little appalling that the best records on these groups are not held by any part of our federal government or our surveillance apparatus. They're held by the Southern Poverty Law Center and the ADL and um, Center for Democratic Renewal and Western States Rights Center. They're held by watchdogs that have stepped in to do the work of trying to curtail this activity. I think that's, you know, you can tell that story as a amazing sort of moment of civilians stepping up to do that work, or you can tell it as a failure of the FBI to do that job. And I think, you know, both of those histories are reasonable to talk about. Talk a little bit about how these domestic groups interact internationally. We saw direct crossover when in the Christchurch um, incident, for example, where it was kind of the same language that we heard from the tree of life. Um, And it seems to have a very close correspondence at times. Do these groups interact? Do they cross radicalize? What's the relationship between groups overseas and domestic groups? This is another area that I think is um, new in terms of the historical research, but these are profoundly transnational groups, and they have been for quite a long time. So Aryan Nations, which was one of the larger and more organized groups in the 1980s and early 90s, was sending its material to other countries um, and also into prisons in a very organized way. Um, World Church of the Creator put up uh, chapters in multiple other countries. Um, And those are just the U.S. groups. There were also German activists coming into the United States to share information with groups. Um, There's information moving back and forth across the Canadian border. And all of that is before they really got going with the Internet. So the Internet, I think, has just dramatically um, made more efficient and faster that work of connecting people ideologically across time and space. 
Um, so, you know, if you think about somebody like the Christchurch gunman who grew up in Australia, he would have been able to access white power content by mail order catalog and cassette tape for many, many years, and then also online in the recent past. So these are long and sort of um, robust transnational ties between people and groups. Fascinating. So we come back to how the heck do we deal with this? <laughs> what do we do? Is there historical evidence about diffusing or diminishing the influence of these groups? Or is it simply a law enforcement problem? Um, what's your take on a solution or a, at least a way of containing the problem? Sure. Well, I think any historian of the United States will want something that goes beyond a law enforcement and court solution, because we know that we have a lot of racial inequality built into those systems um, and that those systems have not done a great job in constraining the violence of primarily white men. Um, however, we need those two, because I think that Personally, I think that they are too too highly organized and too too well well armed to not need those tools. But I think we also need education. I think we need social services intervention. I think we need de-radicalization mechanisms. Um, and I think we need a whole bunch of upstream work about disinformation and recruitment. Um, so there is a institute that perhaps you can link to on your podcast. Uh, American University has the Peril Institute, um, which has excellent response materials for community members, parents, educators, local politicians about what to do if you see this kind of activity in your neighborhood or in your newspaper or elsewhere, what you might think about doing. Um, I would encourage everyone to s just do the work. And I this is not a small thing. The news is like a fire hose of information. And I know that asking for your attention is an ask. But if you can try to pay attention to this problem and do the work of connecting these stories together and encouraging your media to connect the stories together, I think that is a huge thing people can do. Um, and finally, I would just note that the problem of disinformation and radicalization tends to fall on people who have few resources and allies in our society, like school librarians who are the people looking over the shoulder of kids going on YouTube, right? Or busy parents who don't have childcare and they're using the internet as a babysitter, right? These people really can use help. Your neighbors can use help. Um, and in your community, there will be places that you personally can help. So I would encourage people to look through those resources and maybe, maybe think about, is there a way that you can reach out to your neighbors about this problem? We will definitely include a link to the American University um, site uh, in our uh, show notes. Let me um, raise a personal bugaboo, which is the press seems unwilling, unable to contextualize this. Yes. We are getting a view of this election as if it were any election, that these are two parties with different views, different leaders. Okay, this guy's old, this guy's head of a fascist movement. You know, <laughs> it's, um, yeah. it, it is just a willful aversion. Is there something about our press that makes it uniquely incapable? Is it that they need to have historians on board, which I have <laughs> actually suggested that they should have historians working? What do you think the disconnect is? It's so dramatic um, that it kind of defies logic at times. Um, there was a, a brilliant Daily Show opener about this this week where um, Jon Stewart has returned to hosting The Daily Show, I think, out of a, a sense of obligation to this right. moment. Um, and his reporting staff was sort of doing a shtick about like, I'm reporting from the diner. I'm reporting from the more rural part of the diner. I'm reporting from the most <laughs> comfy part of the diner. And it just, I so appreciated it because it does feel like we're reading all the same stories again. And, you know, it's hard. I, 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 I would never be one to blame journalists because if you look around at all of these layoffs and the way that journalism has become so constricted, um, in what people can write and how much time they can spend. I totally get it. This is a really hard thing to see 
all at once in real time. So I would I I would love to be a resource for journalists. I know other historians would love to be a resource for journalists. There's a old yellowed clip of an onion article on the the refrigerator in my department lounge, the history department that says local historians remind everyone to please just ask them before making any big decisions. Like <laughs> and I <laughs> I feel great. that, you know. On the other hand, like I think there are other ways that this is a bigger problem than journalism. We need filmmakers to make the bigger story about this. We need people doing those long form projects to engage these really hard stories. We need to be able to tell the other kinds of stories. And it's it's often not something that you can fit into an article um, or even into a series. You could You could read everything about the Proud Boys if you're a Proud Boys beat reporter and write an excellent series about the Proud Boys without ever talking about the rest of it, you know? Exactly. Um, it's a story problem. And it's, I think it's, it's too big to fall on any one person or any one industry. So I, I think, I think what's called for is everybody, you know, staying tuned in and doing their best work. Um, not just about this, but as we come up to this incredibly important election. Well, I would implore historians to write a guide, an easy to follow guide <laughs> for journalists and also to traverse um, the quad or wherever they are over to the journalism department and teach sure. some classes over there. I will um, say I have a, an edited collection called A Field Guide to White Supremacy that includes some suggestions for the AP style book along it, these lines. That is fabulous. Do you have a link for that that we can also include in our oh, show sure, notes? Yes, we I would, can send that to you. Yes. And it's, be it was meant to, to me just say like, if you're falling into this story for the first time and you don't know anything about this yet, here's just some quick background and maybe some people you can ask if you want some context. So, so I'm always trying to think of ways I can be of use. And, um, you know, if you have anything like that, I can help with, please let me know. Brilliant. Brilliant. We will definitely put it in. So let me conclude with asking about what you're working on now. Um, do you have a book coming out? Do you have a new area or a further area that you're taking a deep dive into? Yes. Um, I'm interested in the history of how we get to a cultural acceptance of school shootings and mass shootings such that we get to this thoughts and prayers and then we move on cycle. Fascinating. Um, and it's a discrete period that starts in 1999 with the Columbine shooting. So I'm interested in sort of the, the story of how we get to that and what else might be possible if we unfurl that story. Fascinating. Well, Catherine, B Kathleen, excuse me, Baloo, thank you so much. It has been a fascinating discussion. I would urge uh, our listeners to all pick up a copy of Bring the War Home, the White Power Movement and Paramilitary America. Thank you so much. And uh, as this progresses, unfortunately, I fear in the wrong direction, we will have you back on to help guide us through. Well, I'm happy to help whenever I can. Thank you very much for having me. And that was Kathleen Ballou. Gives us a lot to talk about and a lot to think about. Whatever you think the origin of the current movement is, whether you think it's going back to the Civil War and the KKK, or whether you see its roots in the Vietnam War, or you see it as part of an international fascist movement, understand this, it is not normal. It is not normal American politics in operation. It is something foreign to the spirit and the ethos of our Constitution. It is a threat to our democratic values. And the press, God love them, will never, never say it. Why? Because they don't want to accuse tens of millions of people for following a fascist cult, which is what it is and what they're doing. And because they insist upon this pose of neutrality. Well, on one hand, Biden is old. On the other hand, Trump has these ideas about letting an enemy of the United States invade NATO. You know, that's the kind of mental hijinks we get from the press in an effort to pretend they're neutral, to deflect any allegations that they might be have a liberal bias. But in fact, they wind up misinforming us, under informing us. And so you have to maintain context and you have to remember that in American politics, we have never had someone as president or a former president who identifies with a violent right-wing 
fascist movement. We've had such figures before pop up from time to time, but they've never gotten as far as the White House, and they have never gotten to the nomination of a major party. And that's what we're up against. So it's important that we explain this to our friends, our family, that we use our network to inform people, and that we keep in mind that what is at stake is nothing less than the survival of our freedom, of our democracy, of the rule of law. If you enjoyed this program and you enjoyed our other programs, please tell your friends. They can subscribe at Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or wherever they get their podcasts. Bye-bye.